The Kentucky Legislative Black Caucus is pleased that you are joining us in the latest presentation of this Black History Celebration. Each year we have the opportunity and pleasure of welcoming the community in the Kentucky Capitol Rotunda, which we refer to as our symbolic center of government. This year we're bringing the celebration to you virtually, which is still consistent with our usual face-to-face -face format. We hope that you will enjoy this iteration of the Kentucky Legislative Black Caucus 2021 Black History Celebration.
name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we do prayer for the Black History Month celebration here at the state capitol. May we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, which art in heaven, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see another day, one that we have never seen before and we will never see again. Today, Heavenly Father, we lift up our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help. For we know that our help cometh from you, O Lord, as you are the one who made both heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. So today, Lord, we first thank you for your protective care, which has allowed us to see this brand new day. Heavenly Father, as we begin this celebration of black history, within the hollow walls and halls of this state capitol building, I ask that you continue to bless and protect our governor, Governor Handy Bashur. I also, Lord, pray for your blessings upon Senator Gerald Neal and all the members of the state legislature. Lord, I pray that you will continue to lead and guide them and help them work together for the good of all people in this state during this most difficult and challenging time in our lives. Heavenly Father, we have endured these unprecedented times of the COVID-19 pandemic. We thank you, Lord, for the comfort and protection that only you can provide for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will continue to protect everyone from all harm, hurt, and danger. Lord, we don't always understand your ways, but we do put our trust in your wisdom. We thank you, Lord, for the vaccines you have allowed the scientists to develop. And we pray that you will provide the doctors and all health care workers uh, the knowledge and skills to administer it to your people so that we may be all better protected from this plague in our land. Heavenly Father, now, as we come together today to celebrate Black History Month, we're reminded of how from the rudiments of time you watch over our forefathers and ancestors through the stormy seas of slave ships, slavery, tolls, injustice, hatred, oppression, blood-stained soil, racism, and inequality. For all that you have done, we thank you, Lord. As we celebrate black history, here today, Lord, we also pray for those who honor you with their lips and their hearts are far from you. Oh, my Heavenly Father, I pray today that you lead, guide, and protect all of us as only as you know how. Heavenly Father, I thank you for inspiring so many of your people to march for Black Lives Matters until freedom and peaceful protest for justice and equality, nonviolence and the pursuit of happiness throughout this state and nation. Lord, you created all men in your image, and as you who said, what you created was very good. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a heart of reconciliation and not a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. As we focus and celebrate this day upon the achievements of black and brown skinned people, Lord, help us to also recognize that supremacy is not equality and being swift to promote evil is not love. Heavenly Father, you have told us that if we curse our neighbor, you will curse us. And if you bless our neighbor, you will bless us. So today, Lord, we come together to bless you and not curse one another. Heavenly Father, give us the strength to march on towards your glory. So that in the end, we can hear you say, well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful of a few things. In my house are many things, and I will make you ruler over many. Into the joy of the Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to speak to you on behalf of, of your people. You know, Lord, who they are, who are called by your name and have humbled themselves to pray and now seek your face and resolve to change their wicked ways so that you may hear from heaven and forgive all of our sins and heal our land. Heavenly Father, if it had not been for you on our side, we know not where we would be. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for all of our many sins. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Reginald Meeks. I'm state representative from the 42nd District, and I'm proud to be chairman of the Legislative Black Caucus. 
Every year, the caucus brings to you the history and the legacies of important Kentuckians who have done much to contribute to the growth and development of the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the nation. Black Kentuckians who not only have left their mark here in Kentucky, but who have produced leaders and trailblazers and contributions in virtually every field of endeavor. You're already familiar with many of the names that we honor. Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all times. Whitney M. Young, the head of the National Urban League. Georgia Davis Powers, Kentucky Senator. You may not know of Charles Young, the extraordinary military mind who contributed much to the nation and to all of our well-being. There are many names, known and unknown, that we celebrate 365 days a year. But we use this time here in Black History Month to showcase them. I'm State Representative Attica Scott, serving Kentucky House District 41 in Louisville. And I am State Senator Reginald Thomas. Struggle continues. This is the title of this Black History event. There is the historical struggle against racism and for social justice. There's the struggle for economic equity. There is the struggle reflected in the disparate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. We celebrate the triumphs and contributions of African Americans notwithstanding. Although we celebrate Black History 365 days a year, it was a determined historian that brought emphasis to the contributions of African Americans. The origins of Black History Month lay in the earliest 20th century historian Carter G. Woodson's desire to spotlight the accomplishments of African Americans. Mainstream historians left African Americans out from the narrative of American history until the 1960s. And Woodson worked his entire career to correct this blinding oversight. His creation of Negro History Week in 1926 paved the way for the establishment of Black History Month in 1976, which is now nationally recognized. Black Americans have been making contributions to America from the start. But unlike countless other Americans whose achievements have altered and enriched our lives, these Black Americans remain virtually unknown. It's important, however, to point out their contributions, because all too often, many of us do not realize that black Americans have been making contributions to our country since its inception. In many cases, what they accomplished, they managed to do against all odds, in spite of overwhelming obstacles. These people are an inspiration to everyone who finds him or herself in circumstances that seem impossible to overcome. Black people have fought in this country even when this country did not fight for us. In fact, black people have historically had to fight just to fight in wars. Despite institutional and systemic racism, we have given our all, even our lives. The accomplishments of folks who have matriculated in historically segregated institutions, usually insufficiently supported segregated institutions, is profound. Products of those and those of historically black institutions of higher learning or HBCUs have and continue to produce outstanding contributors to society. I am an HBCU graduate. Today, we have representatives of Kentucky State University and Simmons College of Kentucky. History has recorded the contributions of African Americans in the field of health at all levels. But those stories are only a reflection of folks who have contributed and continue to contribute to the health and well being of our families, communities, and country. I could go on about the people who have made and continue to make contributions in their own right. This is what this Black History celebration is about a chance to reflect and to note the barriers that persist to this day. Yet, we remain encouraged by those of us who are people of goodwill who meet the challenges of today always looking for a better today and a better tomorrow. Hello, I'm Derek Graham, State Representative and the Kentucky House Democratic Caucus Chair. And I am State Representative Pamela Stevenson. 
It is our custom to acknowledge the dedicated leadership of those who have gone before us and those who continue to serve the Commonwealth. Representative Charles W. Anderson, Representative Dennis Henderson, Representative Jesse H. Lawrence, Representative Felix Sylvester Anderson, Representative William H. Childress, Representative Amelia M. Tucker, Representative Arthur Lloyd Johnson, Representative J. E. Smith, Representative Jesse P. Waters, Senator Georgia M. Davis Powers, Representative May Street Kidd, Representative Hughes E. McGill, Representative Aubrey Wims, Representative Carl R. Hines, Representative E. Porter Hatcher, Jr. Senator Gerald Neal. Representative Leonard Gray. Representative Jesse Crenshaw. Representative Arnold Simpson. Representative Eleanor Jordan. Representative Paul Bather. Representative Reginald K. Meeks. Representative Derek W. Graham. Representative Daryl T. Owens. Representative Jim Glenn. Senator Reginald Thomas. Representative George Brown, Jr. Representative Jeff Taylor. Representative Attica Scott. Representative Charles Booker. Representative Nima Kakarni. Representative Pamela Stevenson. We honor these legislative pioneers today by calling the row, recognizing the contributions of African American members of the Kentucky General Assembly and their leadership and service to our great commonwealth. The Legislative Black Caucus invites leadership of the other branches of government to bring greetings in their own way. Hi everyone. Thank you for inviting me to join you for the sixth straight year to celebrate Black History Month. And thank you for doing this in a way that is safe for everybody, putting people's lives first. I think back to last year's event and it was moving. As we were able to right a historic wrong by posthumously promoting Colonel Charles Young to Brigadier General in the Kentucky National Guard. And just last week, I asked the Biden administration to do the same. When we have a chance to recognize and admit historic wrongs, we must do so. But then, we ought to do something about them. We've seen history this last year. History in the sense of 400 years of slavery, segregation, and Jim Crow leading to calls for justice. Justice for individuals and in society. My commitment is to listen. I know I will never be able to feel the weight and the emotion of those 400 years, and I've never suffered from systematic inequality. So I listen, I try to hear, and I try to see. What we've all seen during this pandemic is what systematic inequality to health care truly does. During the summer, we were losing black and African-American Kentuckians to COVID-19 at twice the rate that they make up of the population. But that wrong also shows what being intentional can do. We went to work with our 123 campaign to provide more coverage to those who needed it and to those who were suffering the most. The result, death rates as a percentage of population plummeted and are now in line with the overall population. We were able to work to address a systematic wrong in the midst of a pandemic. So my promise is to continue to be intentional. Intentional in executive branch leadership on boards and commissions and state investment and in the distribution of the COVID vaccine. That's why we're working with community leaders, including legislators and faith leaders. It's why we're gladly saying yes to an offer of help from Raul Cunningham 
and the NAACP. It's going to take hard, intentional work for an equitable rollout, but I am committed. I want to close by thanking so many of you who have been such incredible leaders during this pandemic. And on behalf of my family, thank you for being so supportive. We've worked together during this pandemic, and I know coming out of it that together we can build that better Kentucky and that better world that all of our children deserve. Thank you. Welcome to everyone to the celebration of Black History Month. I want to initially recognize Senators Gerald Neal and Reggie Thomas, two of the Senate members uh, in this chamber and part of the legislative process. They always reach out to me and ask and invite me to give welcome remarks. So I want to recognize them for giving me this opportunity. To the group that is gathered here, it's a great time to recognize those people who have gone before us, who have made the difference in changing the way our society interacts with each other. So in this month of black history, let us remember those individuals and celebrate their lives and accomplishments. But as we go forward, let us look forward to a discussion on how we can make relationships among all people better in a quiet, civil manner, protesting without violence, but having the ability to listen and learn from all perspectives, rural and urban, black and white. Thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to welcome you to this month-long celebration for black history. Thank you to the Black Legislative Caucus for continuing the tradition of inviting the Chief Justice to participate in this ceremony commemorating Black History Month in the Commonwealth. Because of the pandemic, we're celebrating a little differently this year, but I am honored to bring you virtual greetings on behalf of the entire Supreme Court. My fellow justices and I hope you're staying safe and healthy during these difficult times. I was asked to give my remarks today next to the bust of my friend, Justice Bill McAnulty, or Mac, as we all knew him. The bust, which was created by Louisville sculptor Ed Hamilton, is a permanent fixture in the antechamber of the Supreme Court courtroom. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it to the Capitol to record my remarks in person. But with the magic of modern technology, I'm still able to have Mac by my side today. Justice McAnulty was the first African-American justice on the Supreme Court of Kentucky, and the first to hold a cabinet-level position in the Kentucky state government. He also had the distinction of serving at every level of the court system including as a juvenile court judge before the adoption of the judicial article. Mack's many awards and distinction include the Henry V. Pennington Outstanding Judge of the Year Award, the Louisville Bar Association's Judge of the Year Award, the Thomas C. Simmons Leadership Award, the Metro United Way's Allen Society Leadership Award, he also received the Distinguished Alumni Award and was a recipient of the Louis S. Grauman Award from the Louis D. Brandeis School of Law at the University of Louisville. Justice McAnulty was committed to helping the public and his community, serving on the boards of over 10 different organizations during his lifetime, including Metro United Way, the Kentucky Children's Home, and the East End Boys Club of Louisville. But more than anything, Mac was a loyal friend who was known for his sound advice, his quick and sometimes biting wit, and his good nature. So I'm glad we're honoring him again today and every day on the second floor of the Capitol. I want to take this opportunity to tell you about the important work the Kentucky Court of Justice is doing to address racial and ethnic disparities within the court system. Since 2014, our work on these issues has become more intentional and, and our targeted efforts have resulted in remarkable improvements for the individuals and families who come into contact with the courts. In 2020, 
we shared our journey to culture change with the introduction of a guide for identifying, addressing, and reducing racial and ethnic disparities, which documents the four-step model we're now using to reduce disparities within the court system. In many ways, this work was triggered by the sweeping reforms to the Kentucky Juvenile Code that occurred in 2014. Although highly successful in its intent, the reforms primarily benefited white youth and unintentionally exacerbated the disproportionate and disparate outcomes for youth of color in Kentucky's justice system. When the reality of disproportionality in the juvenile justice system was presented, we took action to address it. And this work evolved into a model that we have used throughout the Kentucky Court of Justice. The guide we have created presents a model for any organization to identify disparities, construct strategies to address the disparities, institutionalize effective changes, and reevaluate progress for continuing quality improvement. Our hope is that the work we've done and found to be very effective can support the work of other organizations and local courts in addressing racial and ethnic disparities. Finally, with the help of our diversity and inclusion coordinator, Patrick Carrington, we have established a tradition at AOC of hosting an annual Black History Month event to celebrate the history and contributions of African Americans both inside and outside the Kentucky Court of Justice. I hope that you will all make an effort to tune in to our virtual event on February 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be broadcast live on our Kentucky Court of Justice YouTube channel and also available for viewing on our website at any time. Thank you again for this opportunity to be with you virtually today. Thanks for the chance to be with you today. Whether we meet virtually or in person, I'm honored and grateful for the opportunity to share as we celebrate the contributions of African Americans to our Commonwealth and our nation. This may not be how we thought we would celebrate this year, but it is more important than ever that we focus on how far we've come as we focus on what we must do to continue our progress. I wanted to join you from here on the House floor today because this is the chamber where laws are made. The people who have occupied these desks over the past 11 decades have shaped where we are today, just as the legacy of those who served today will be measured in the future. It was on this floor that Charles Anderson, our state's first African-American legislator, took the oath of office in 1936. The gentleman from Jefferson immediately got to work improving educational opportunities and better access to the public facilities for Kentucky's African-Americans. It was in this chamber that he fought to finally put an end to Kentucky's inhumane public hanging law. This month gives us an opportunity to reflect on Representative Anderson and so many other men and women who have fought against injustice and discrimination. However, it also serves to remind us that the work is not complete. We recognize that there are still disparities in educational, economics, criminal justice, and health outcomes for African-American Kentuckians. Today's House is committed to working with anyone willing to have a constructive conversation to help identify why those disparities exist and pass good long-term policy to address them. We all must live and work together, respecting our differences and laboring toward common goals. After all, we stand under the same flag that displays the motto, united we stand, divided we fall. And we all want the same things for our Commonwealth. We are all Kentuckians. Again, thank you for inviting me to join you. Hello, I'm Joni Jenkins, Kentucky House Democratic Leader. And it's an honor to be with you as we celebrate Black History Month in Kentucky. I wish we could all be together, but this is the second best thing. I am speaking to you from the Kentucky House of Representatives, which is very fitting as today I'm reminded of all the great legislators who have gone before us, including so many legislators of color, like my good friend, the former representative Daryl T. Owens. Great things have happened in Kentucky, but there's still much, much work to be done. In COVID times, it seems harder to have your voices heard, so maybe we all have to work a little bit harder. I'm looking forward to great strides being taken in this year and beyond to make Kentucky a great place for everyone to live. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been great being with you, and we have so much to celebrate this year. Thank you.
Welcome to the Legislative Black History Month celebration. It's not just a celebration, but an opportunity. An opportunity not only to re-examine Kentucky's history, but also to confront today's newspaper headlines and social media traffic. Yes, let's look back, but let's also look around and look forward. We can look back, not simply on unjust policies, but on some of the black sons and daughters of Kentucky who lived or who lived a special part of their life here who've gone on and fought and persevered through challenging times to achieve great things. People like Margaret Garner, Charles Henry Parrish, Charles Young, Nellie Conley, Isaac Murphy, Todd Duncan, Whitney Young, Muhammad Ali, State Senator Georgia Davis Powers, and Lyman T. Johnson. We can also look around at today's black achievers and leaders who continue to shine a light and show the way. People like sculptor Ed Hamilton, poet Frank X. Walker, and pastor educator Kevin Cosby. The longest serving state legislator in Kentucky's history who's an African American, Gerald Neal, who serves here with me today. The NAACP's Raul Cunningham, the Urban League's Sadiqa Reynolds. Like all those people who simply stood in front of police lines last year and demanded justice for Breonna Taylor. All those who simply insisted that a racially contorted justice system be hammered straight. We can look ahead to a day when the original confounding irony of our country's creation is finally resolved in real truth and in justice. We can lift up those who offer creative ways to heal the heartache of our history. We can lift up those who know there's remedy in social stability, equal justice, accessible health care, decent housing, educational opportunity, and job possibility. We can lift ourselves up to the meaning of our history to the urgency of our challenge and to the demands of our conscience, We can lift up our voices and sing a song of freedom and justice for all. I'm State Representative Nima Kulkarni. I represent District 40 in Jefferson County. Long-standing systemic health and social inequities have put the black community and other racial and minority groups at higher risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. The term racial and ethnic minority groups includes people of color with a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. But some experiences are common to many people within these groups, and economic and social conditions have historically prevented fair opportunities for economic, physical, and emotional health. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Terrence Sullivan, the Executive Director of the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. And you might be wondering, why is the spot behind me currently empty? Jefferson Davis, born in Fairview, Kentucky in 1808, was the first and only president of the Confederate States of America. A West Point graduate, he served in the Mexican-American War and later was a U.S. Senator from Mississippi but he certainly made his mark in Kentucky history. He was elevated to a place of honor in the Kentucky State Capitol Rotunda, the revered symbolic center of government by installing a 12-foot, five-ton statue of his likeness in 1936. It is not only the fact that he was charged as a traitor, yes, for treason, for participating in the secession of many Southern states from the Union which precipitated a civil war which he led as president of the Confederacy. This act was a direct violation of the supreme law of the land, the United States Constitution. It is not only the fact that he and others contributed to the deaths of a reported 620,000. If that total is adjusted for today's population, that's 6.2 million dead. And the enslavement of over 4 million, which translates into 40 million in today's numbers by some historical estimates. No, it is not only the fact that Jefferson Davis was a fierce defender of keeping black people in bondage for much of his life, but his being also an owner of the enslaved himself. It was not even the fact that he was an unrepentant racist who even advocated and championed segregationist and white supremacist policies after the Civil War. No, it's not just those things that warranted a removal. Those things are just historical fact. Erected under the auspices of the Daughters of the Confederacy as part of their national effort to install symbols of white supremacy during periods of U.S. history when black Americans were lynched and their civil rights were aggressively under attack, it was placed in the rotunda. It was because of this act of exalting a lost cause at the expense of those that suffered due to the callous disregard for human decency could not stand. Not if we aspire to make this a more perfect union. Calls to remove Davis from the rotunda, where thousands of tourists visit each year, have been made for years by leaders in the state. The Kentucky Legislative Black Caucus had joined others across the state in this effort. And finally, a governor. Governor Andy Bashir responded early in his administration to initiate the removal of this bold demonstration of insensitivity and insult to the descendants of those enslaved individuals. What symbol of black pride and historical relevance will fill this vacant spot in the Kentucky State Capitol Rotunda? How will the people of the Commonwealth validate this decision? And by what process? A process has been proposed and expressions of support have been indicated. This is yet another opportunity for the Commonwealth to address this issue, not arbitrarily, but upon reflection, with the seriousness that it demands. We welcome this opportunity to unite and honor the contributions of Black Kentuckians. So let's get this right. And that is a moment in history. Hello, I'm Representative George Brown, representing Kentucky's 77th Legislative House District. It is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Georgia State Representative Billy Mitchell. 
president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. Representative Mitchell is the current minority caucus chair of the Georgia House of Representatives, and he represents the 88th district since 2003. Representative Mitchell leads more than 700 members of the NBCSL, which is the National Black Caucus of State Legislators, who represent more than 60 million black Americans. NBCSL serves as a national network advocate and catalyst for public policy innovation, information exchange, and joint action on the critical issues affecting African Americans and other marginalized communities. But his career in public service began in 1995 when he was elected to the Stone Mountain, Georgia City Council. Representative Mitchell, welcome to the Kentucky Legislative Black Caucus Black History Celebration Program as our speaker. We're honored to have you. I do want to thank the members of the Kentucky Legislative Black Caucus for what I consider an awesome privilege of addressing you at this celebration. Despite these pandemic times in which we exist today, we certainly can and we must observe Black History Month, so I applaud you for commem commemorating, even virtually. As president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators, I preside over the organization that represents the interests of the nation's African-American state legislators throughout the U.S. and U.S. possessions, who serve over 70 million Americans and whose past members include 40 percent of the current U.S. Congressional Black Caucus, as well as the 44th president of the United States. Among your state caucus, my friends, Representative Meek serves on our executive board, and the renowned Senator Gerald Neal is also doing great work as our organization's parliamentarian. The Kentucky Legislative Black Caucus, along with the caucuses of 45 other states and possessions, are truly among our ancestors' wildest dreams. Growing up, my grandmother used to tell me that you are judged by the company you keep. I wish she was still here to see me uh, with you all today. She would have thought that I made something of myself. You see, Jesus will say to some in government, I was hungry and you cut food stamps. I was thirsty and you poisoned the water in Flint, Michigan. I was a stranger and you tried to build a wall at the border, ripped children from their parents, some never to be reunited again. I was imprisoned because of your prison industrial complex. Some will say, Lord, when did we do this to you? But as Reverend Whitlock knows, he'll reply, in as much as you did it to the least of these, you've also done it unto me. Even as the struggle continues, we were all called for such times as these. The legislative district I represent includes uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia, where prior to being elected to the state legislature, I was the vice mayor and chair of the finance committee. I authored an ordinance that granted the city the authority to erect the Freedom Bell in the middle of its downtown, commemorating Dr. King's call in his immortal I Have a Dream speech to let freedom ring even from Stone Mountain of Georgia. I remember at the unveiling of the Freedom Bell on that Martin Luther King Day some 20 years ago, many in the media were present. Among the questions a reporter posed was, do you think Dr. King would be pleased with it? I responded, certainly he would have appreciated the symbolism that the bell represented, but I think he would have appreciated even more as I pointed to an ATM machine on the city's property about 50 feet away, that as chair of the finance committee, I placed much of the financial portfolio of the city in the local black owned bank, thereby creating economic opportunities for the community that were theretofore unseen. How did I get such passion? I recall a story that my grandmother would tell me, it along with others she told, shaped who I am today. She foresaw a better day for those who would come after. She told me of the time when two of her friends were in Aliceville, Alabama, where they were arrested for registering people to vote and teaching them how to use the absentee ballot. Well, my grandmother and others, including the Reverend Dr. Joseph Lowry, said we were going to protest. We were going to march all the way through the county, tie up the traffic, and then go bail the women out of jail. Well, as they were planning the march, word had gotten out that the sheriff in the county was going around to their community giving out hams and turkeys telling folk not to get in march, get involved with the march, as they had good relationships there. 
Well, my grandmother said at the time she didn't think anything of it. She didn't think that people would sell their souls for hams and turkeys. Well, at the day that the march was to begin, they were expecting some 300 people there, but only a few dozen people had showed up. My grandmother thought, is it possible that people are selling their souls for hams and turkey? My grandmother and others decided that if God was on their side, they still had the majority. So she decided to march on anyway. And uh, it started to sleet. And people thought it was the sleet on my grandmother's face. But she would tell me later that uh, she thought she was crying uh, just thinking about people selling their souls for hams and turkey. Well, my, my grandmother would tell me that her feet started to hurt, so I knew that the story was coming to an end shortly. Uh, those of you, don't, you don't know my grandmother, but I knew that the story was coming to a close shortly. But my grandmother said she then said a prayer. She said if folk did not care any more about their condition, that they would sell their souls for hams and turkeys, maybe she didn't need to be out there either well let me tell you to make a long story short they did march on and they did bail the women out of jail but let me tell you what happened at that first stop as they turned the corner there waiting on them were over 600 others oh and they had their marching shoes on and they also had baskets and those baskets were full of ham sandwiches and turkey sandwiches to feed the hungry marches Oh, Rosa Parks, one of my sheroes for sure. Late last summer, I read a book called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks by the author Jean Theo Harris. The author did a brilliant job of recapturing her identity. She, like Dr. King, has been a victim of identity theft by mainstream media, which has sanitized and romanticized their lives when the reality is Rosa Parks was a true rebel with the cause. December 1st, 1955. She boarded that bus in Montgomery, looked up into her chagrin. The bus driver was someone with whom she'd had issues with previously, but she said ain't no thing, paid her fare, and took her seat. You know the story. As the bus filled, the bus driver turned around and instructed all the black people to stand and surrendered their seats to white passengers. Rosa refused. The bus driver gave her one more chance. She still refused. So he got off the bus to use a payphone. You know, they didn't have cell phones back then. He called the police and you know what happened. The police came and here is where the book blew me away. The author said that when the police came, they gave the bus driver a choice to either have her just removed from the bus or to have her arrested. Had she been just removed, who knows how much longer Jim Crow would have lasted. But this arrogant bus driver said, no, don't just remove her, arrest her. And they arrested her into destiny. How do I know? Well, a few years ago, I was invited to Washington, D.C. Statuary Hall for the unveiling of a statue of Rosa Parks. And get this, there is no statue of the bus driver. I looked. Now that was good, wasn't it? That was real good. But guess what? I was sharing that story recently in Montgomery, Alabama as a part of a program I was on, and a seasoned citizen came up to me afterwards and said, those were some great remarks you made. Oh, and a great story about my girl Rosa. But you didn't tell the whole story. You didn't give them the shout line. I said, I thought I did give the shout line. I mentioned Statuary Hall. He said, no, that was good, but it's not the shout line. Curious then, I said, well, what is the shout line? He said, I live in Montgomery, been here all my life. I knew Rosa Parks personally. I stayed off the buses for 381 long days with her. I'll give you the shout line. The shout line is after the buses had finally been desegregated by the order of the United States Supreme Court on the eve of the bus company going bankrupt because we stuck together and helped one another, we had made up our minds that since Rosa had started this thing, we would make sure she would be the first one to board the bus. Oh, we all gathered at the time and location of the first stop. We gathered with much anticipation. Oh, we sang songs and prayed prayers. We could finally see the bus approaching. The bus pulled up. The door swung open. And guess who the bus driver was? The same bus driver who had her arrested now had to drive her 
to her destination. So let's show the world that despite insurrection attempts and attacks on democracy, just like in our ancestors' times, even though the struggle continues, we must take the talents and positions and influence that we have to make a difference for all. Now, I'm a fan of the movie Black Panther. Yes, Wakanda forever. I've watched it frequently because I always find something motivational in it. And, you know, T'Challa is preparing to become king of Wakanda. He is the prince about to become king. But before he can become king, he has to take on any challenger. Once you overcome your challenges, you get to sit on the throne. That's worth shouting right there. You remember Mbako. Mbako comes down from the hills to challenge T'Challa to be king as was permissible in Wakanda law. And it looked as though Mbako was winning the challenge. Mbako was holding T'Challa in a strong bear hug-like grip. T'Challa was leaning over the edge of a cliff where water was falling. It appeared that T'Challa was on the verge of falling over and plunging to his death. Well, watch this. Through his blurred vision, he sees his mother, played by the regal Angela Bassett, who yells out, show him who you are. He then develops the strength that comes from knowing who you are. You see, once he heard, show him who you are, he said, I'm T'Challa, son of T'Chaka. And the next thing you know, he whipped on M'Baku and became the king. Let me give you another. My favorite athlete of all times is Muhammad Ali from right here in Kentucky. Some of you may remember when Ali was in Zaire, Africa to fight big bad George Foreman, they called it the rumble in the jungle. Every day Ali came to train in the gym, he was met with the sound of drummers drumming and shouting, the champ is here, the champ is here. He came every day announcing his own arrival that way. Of course, hate-filled reporters approached Ali because they could not understand how he could announce the champ is here when George Foreman was the world title holder. Check out how Ali responded. He said, I'm not saying the title holder is here. I'm saying the champ is here. George has the title, but the champ is who I am. Essentially, he was saying he may have the position, but I have the power. I'm glad to be here with you to say to someone who may not have any position anywhere that just because you don't have position doesn't mean you don't have power to go forth, even though the struggle continues. Many folk have position, but someone else has the power. You do know Abraham Lincoln had position, but Frederick Douglass had the power. Woodrow Wilson had position, but Paul Roberson had the power. You do know that the bus driver on December 1st, 1955 had position, but Rosa Parks had the power. Lyndon Johnson had the position, but Martin Luther King Jr. had the power. I may be president of NBCSL, but Senators Neal and Thomas and Representatives Brown, Graham and Kulkarni, Meeks and Scott have the power. Now, once again, I, I appreciate your celebration of Black History Month. It is not only through the diversity of culture and personality that makes us all better, but the diversity in thought, ideas and opinions. Continued best wishes to you all. We thank Representative Billy Mitchell president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators for that thoughtful and rewarding presentation in recognition of his contributions to this event as keynote and for the great work that he is doing across America. We present these joint resolutions passed by the House and Senate expressing our appreciation. Each year, we present our Legacy Award to an outstanding individual who has made a significant mark in the history of Kentucky. This is the highest expression of appreciation from the Kentucky Legislative Black Caucus. Kentucky. This presentation will take place later in the month. Well, there you have it. Great musical performances by our HBCUs, Kentucky State University and Simmons College of Kentucky. A message from the president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. A confirmation and celebration of the contributions of African Americans to the history of our country. Don't forget to join us for part two in this celebration as we present the Legacy Award. And we'll be joined by Lonnie Bunch, director of the Smithsonian Institute, Washington, DC. We wish to thank all of you who have contributed to this celebration. And we especially thank you for joining in as we leave with the benediction by Reverend Leslie Whitlock and a parting musical presentation 
by the Kentucky State University Concert Choir. May the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us this day and forevermore. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Awake, awake, the lute and harp, awake and now the dawn. Go away, my glory.